why don't we talk about Western Digital and their 20 terabyte hard drives? Here is, and we can, we can, we can talk about sort of the, the technical details a little bit later. So this was posted by Andre Arjunel, Arjunu, Arjunu, Andre Arjunu on the forums. And we'll go through this stuff later. Is anybody actually asking for a 20 terabyte hard drive? You are, aren't you? Am I? I don't know. You just bought a bunch of hard drives recently. Um, oh, wait, no. Not hard drives. SSDs. Are these hard drives or SSDs? These are hard drives. Oh, is this more like... No, that can't be right. Is that right? Do, do data centers use hard drives or SSDs? They use both. Okay, so is this more for data centers and all so that stuff again? here's the thing. Um, Okay, so you know what? Fine. Let's run through. Let's run. Th let's let's run through this. So they're sampling enterprise OEMs with 20 terabyte UltraStar DC HC650 hard drives, utilizing shingled magnetic recording and helium-filled enclosure. So the helium is to improve the efficiency of the drive as the platter spins because I there's knew that. more. Air resistance, although it's helium resistance now, it's not air. Um, and shingled magnetic recording takes the tracks that are laid out in circles on the drive platter and actually overlaps them a little bit. We've done some really good content on this in the past. Uh, basically what it means is that there's no penalty while you're reading it. It means you can squeeze them closer together. There's no penalty while you're reading it. But if you need to write it, well, here, give me another shingle. Perfect, thank you. If I need to change this middle shingle, now I need to also delete this one so that I can get at it, change it, and then put this back. So there is a write performance penalty with shingled magnetic drives. So Seagate has used shingled magnetic recording in their archive series in the past, and I've actually used them. I have found that the write penalty, uh, particularly if it is a write once, read many application, doesn't really matter that much, um, but your mileage may vary. If you're going to try and write a ton of random data to it, like sequential is okay. If you're just archiving like a bunch of video footage, uh, which is the only thing I was using them for in the time we had them deployed, hey, no big deal. But if you're going to hit them with a bunch of random I.O., you're really going to suffer because every single one of those uh, bits that you need to flip is going to have a whole bunch of them that you need to then upend, move somewhere else, flip it, and then rewrite. It's, it's a total mess. And really, it's actually kind of akin to the way that SSDs write, which is part of why writing performance on SSDs is so much worse than shingled magnetic drives. Yes, guys, I understand that they are functionally very different on a hardware level. I just mean conceptually they are similar in that you might need to change a very small thing, but you actually have to erase and move then change it, and then put other stuff back once you're done. Uh, the new drives utilize nine platters. Are you familiar with what a hard drive platter is? It's like a little metal disc. Little metal disc. Yeah. So traditional hard drives used a single platter, and you could have um, recording space on both sides. Yeah. Now imagine this. Having nine. You've got nine yeah. of those packed into a No wonder they need to fill it with helium in order to keep the air resistance down low enough to make this thing even reasonably efficient. So if one platter goes, does your whole hard drive go? No, if one platter goes, you can in some cases, uh, we actually did a great video about this where we toured drive savers. Um, so someone like drive savers might be able to go in, replace the, uh, the read head so that's like this arm yeah, that, that sticks reads, out yep. over all the, all the different platters. They might be able to replace it and then put on a new one, because usually it would be that that fails, not like the platter, the platter itself, itself that fails, because it's just, it's just magnetic ones and zeros on a, on a metal disc. Um, there's Got not it. as much to fail, unless the, uh, the read head were to Scratch fail it. spectacularly and, and crash. It's called a, a head crash. If that were to hit it, well, it might scratch a bunch of the data, but you might still be able to get a bunch of it back, assuming that you can get uh, a new uh, read head in. So anyway, where was I going with this? Right, you've got nine of these monsters. You've got this immensely complicated apparatus that's required to read off of them. Um, What's a, so it has a two and a half million hour MTDF. Mean time between failure. So okay. that's really kind of where I was eventually going to make my way to with this. Um, so they're advertising them for their sequential write use case because, uh, yeah, single magnetic recording is not fast enough for random writes. So here's my problem. The only way that we can make hard drives faster is either by shrinking the size of the bits on the platters 
or by spinning them faster. Really, that's, that's it. Because if you think about it like the way that a record player works, yeah. right? The only way to make the song go faster is to put the notes closer together or to spin the record faster. Yeah. That's all that you can really do. Now, Seagate actually is working on a dual actuator technology that would allow two separate read and write operations to take place simultaneously. Oh, that's kind of cool. The, ni the nine that are on these 20 terabyte drives, they would all move together. So if you need something on like the top platter, the, the bottom one can't go get something from somewhere else Actually, on the bottom one. why hasn't somebody one. thought of that sooner? That well, I'm getting to that. Okay. So on paper, <clears throat> this is great. 20 terabyte drives <clears throat> would mean that in something like a 60 drive Storinator, let's just do a quick calculate. I don't, I don't, what, why is PowerShell opening? Wow, I hate you so much. Okay, so 60 times 20. In something like a 60 drive Storinator, in a single 4U rack with just 60 drives, you could put 1.2 petabytes of data. Even if you're giving up, let's say one in every six drive, as you might, to something like, uh, you know, RAID Z2 or, you know, some, some kind of uh, parity data protection, you could put a petabyte of data in a single 4U rack, that's incredible. The problem is that the only way to speed up the performance of these drives is complicated technology like dual actuators. Remember, we're in these tiny three and a half inch enclosures. Spinning it faster, which adds more, uh, it adds more drag as the platters spin. It adds more complexity because all of a sudden everything has to be done more to within. More failure. Right, that's okay. exactly where we're going with this. So. Hard drives, their capacities keep getting bigger, but their performance is stuck because we can't spin them faster and we can't really put the bits meaningfully any closer together. All we can do is add more platters at this point. And so what that means is that a 20 terabyte drive at what is pretty typical, uh, you know, let's say like a, a Ah, oh, man, these are shingled. So let's say it can write at 200 megabytes a second, all right? So let's do let's do some quick napkin math. We can do what just happened. No, nope. okay. I don't know what you did. Two hundred. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Two hundred megabytes a second times. Uh, hold on a second. Sixty seconds. Okay. So we've managed. What, oh, what can I do for you? What, he, he wants me to. You're doing math. Talk about how many shirts we sell at LTTStore.com. Oh. Bye. Oh, okay. Yeah, lots of shirts at LTTStore.com. Do we even have stock of anything right now? Sort of. It's fine. Sort of. Stealth hoodies, water bottles. Oh, uh, black and gold water bottles are back in stock, right? No, stealth water oh, bottles. Oh, stealth water stealth. bottles. Okay. Black here's and gold here's one. Later. Wait, later. All right. Yeah. yeah, we had a great holiday season. Thank you guys so much, by the way, um, on LTT Store. Okay, so. Uh, in a minute, I can write uh, 12,000 megabytes. Okay, so let's do times 60 again. In an hour, I can write 720,000 megabytes. Uh, so times 24, so let's say in a day. <clears throat> all right, in a day, I can finally write almost the entire surface of this drive. So, do you remember, I think we actually talked about this back when we were in university. Although, I think it was in the context of USB thumb drives. Okay. Okay. This is a long time ago to try to remember. Yeah, I doubt you're gonna remember, but <laughs> okay. the point is, guys, when we were in, like, probably I'd say around grade 10, USB thumb drives were like, the biz. They were so cool, remember that? I don't know about grade 10, maybe grade I'd nine? say, no, I'd say university for me anyway. Okay, well, it was, it was, I remember when I got my first, what was it? It was, I think it was 16 megabytes. I got my okay. first USB thumb drive. So you can remember yeah. how many megabytes are on your very first thumb drive, but you can't remember my birthday. I remember <laughs> your birthday now. I forgot her birthday the first year we were dating. <laughs> Yep, I have, nev I have never uh, heard the end of it, as you guys can see. Okay, so anyway, back to USB thumb drives. My first USB thumb drive was 16 megabytes, and I was jazzed because I didn't have to use floppy disks to carry my assignments to and from school anymore. Like, wow. And I could even put files that weren't just text. Like if I wanted to share a cool song that I definitely got totally legally on Napster <laughs> uh, with a friend, I could bring that to school and give it to them and they could transfer it to their thumb drive. And it was like, whoa, I can take this to my computer at home and put it on my, my mini disc 
player, whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> but around the time that I met you, we started to run into this problem. So USB 3 hadn't come along yet to fix it, but USB 2 thumb drives were getting to the point where the capacity was so large that and there were still some kind of reliability issues with them, especially when you were using them on older systems, that you couldn't really count on them to not have some kind of a, of a problem if you needed to get all the data off of it in an emergency or something like that. Like, it wasn't really safe to store that much data on this tiny thing. And I remember we had this conversation. Do you remember this at all? No, not at all. Yeah, I knew you weren't listening. It's fine. <laughs> um, I listened to lots of other things, just not this part. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So the point is, the point that I'm getting to, and, and we solved that problem with faster interfaces. So now you can use USB 3 or Thunderbolt 3 to read and write off of these multi-terabyte portable drives. And, and we, we kind of fixed it by just going really, really way faster. But hard drives, in that time, hard drives have maybe doubled in speed, except that when I met you, a uh, 500 gig hard drive was pretty sweet. And now we're talking drives that are literally, what, 40 times that size? Is that right? Am I doing the math right? Can you help me with the math here? 20 terabytes, you yeah. say 500? Yeah, that's 500, right. yeah. yeah, 40 times the size. So here, here's, my, here's my rough, what, what, what is this? Why is this full screen? Here's my rough napkin math here, guys. Uh, let's just make sure there's not, yeah, nothing incriminating. There's my rough napkin math. So in 24 hours, I can write not quite that entire drive. So at what point are hard drives just not practical for this kind of storage, even if they are cheap? Well, we might be there unless they're really cheap, unless you can literally buy two or three of them for the price that you could store that data on something else, and then you can just have it like duplicated, and in the event that something fails while you're trying to recover it, you just grab it from the other one, copy it over to, uh, like, it, it, it starts to become this very complicated data management scheme. Um, so hard drive manufacturers are still pretty bullish on their future. They think the hard drive is gonna be around for a good long while. But I think that for general consumers who can't afford these complicated data management schemes, we might be getting close to the end because I don't know about you guys, but I don't necessarily want, even in my home NAS, I don't necessarily want a drive that, remember, if I'm copying this over gigabit, is now going to take more than two days. I don't necessarily want a drive that, in the event that I'm dealing with some kind of data emergency, is going to take two days for me to know if it's going to be OK. And the like, especially crazy thing about this is if you talk to some data center clients, some enterprise clients, they're not even asking for this. Backblaze famously uses, I think it's Shoot, don't quote me on this. It's either four or six terabyte drives. Backblaze uh, drives, which ones do they use? And the reason is that they've found that from a, from a cost per terabyte, total cost of ownership perspective, the newer models actually have not had a great advantage for them. And they have preferred the better reliability of these less complex drives, even if it means that they ultimately have to deploy more servers over more cabinets in a larger area in the data, in the data center. Uh, let me just have a look. So drive counts. So they are using up to 14 terabyte drives now, but I can't remember which one was the bulk of their storage. Uh, it looks like they're using 12 terabytes now, so maybe, I, maybe I'm mistaken on that one. They did have higher failure rates with those 12 terabyte drives than they did on here. Guys, I can pull up their latest uh, reliability report. They actually um, published this back in, it looks like, March. <clears throat> Remember, too, though, guys, that, uh, let's see, drive days. Oh, wow, actually, those Toshiba ones are looking pretty good. Single failure. Annualized failure rate. So what are drive days? The number of times it was used? Or like number of days it was used? Uh, I think that's the total day. Like it's um, how long it's been used times the number of drives mm, would, be my, okay. would be my understanding here. Oh, two million drive days. 
So yeah, it might be that that was uh, might be that that was outdated information. So either way, it's going to come down to this complex relationship between how much the drive costs versus how much it costs for the thing that it needs to go in versus how often it fails and how complex and disastrous it is when it fails. Some people are like, what about SSHD? So SSHD is basically a small SSD that's kind of like soldered onto a hard drive. And I think you may be sort of misunderstanding the purpose of SSHD if you think that it's applicable here. So any hard drive, whether it's got a small SSD cache on it or not, is ultimately limited by how fast it spins and how close the bits are. An SSHD takes frequently accessed data and caches it onto an SSD so that in the event that there's like a game that you always play, um, instead of grabbing it from the magnetic platters, it can grab that off the SSD and you feel like it's super responsive. Now, usually these, these SSDs are so small that something like a game wouldn't end up being cached. It's more like uh, files that Windows frequently accesses, stuff like that. Um, or maybe you know components of DirectX or your graphics driver that it would access as you're loading up a game. So it can accelerate almost anything, um, but it doesn't help if the data doesn't fit in the cache. So when we're talking about writing to the entire surface of a drive, it would do meaningfully nothing. And when you're talking about reading from the entire surface of the drive, it's negligible again. So it wouldn't really help with that. Who writes to an entire 20 terabyte hard drive over one or two days, though? Um, well, OK, so here's an example. Uh, we're rolling a new uh, petabyte project. OK, so I understand so when you're. During deployment. OK, I understand during deployment, but that only happens theoretically once or twice. Like yes. for day to day use, isn't this OK? This is a great way to, like, if you don't have a lot of space in your house and you are slow mo guys or whatever and you need lots of space. So another scenario, and this is the dangerous scenario, and it might not matter today, but it might matter five years from now. Here's the scenario. You've got eight of these things yeah. spinning in a little enclosure like this sitting on your desk. One of them dies. All right. So that's a total of 8 times 20 is 160 terabytes of data, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that right? 180 terabytes? Help what, me. Eight no, times 160, 20, 160, yeah. 160 terabytes of data. All of it is now at risk because, one because of 20 terabytes of data that now needs to be restored to another drive. Now, during that restore operation, I pull that failed drive as soon as I possibly okay. can. I put in a new one. Now I need to wait. Two days, I understand. Every that. one of those drives has to be read entirely, so and one of them has to be written to entirely. A process that could take over a day. While well, I'm sitting there going, ah, and I can't sleep. You can, can you tell I've gone through this before? You've seen me go through this before. OK. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just the way I use hard drives or used to use hard drives. It's like I would write to my C drive and everything would be in my C drive. Yes. And so if I lose a drive, my, like my D drive or E drive or whatever, it, it's fine. But that was back when a hard drive might be 80 gigs. Okay. So what have you got on there? You got two Blu-rays? So, so, okay, Nothing. that's fine. 20 terabytes. You can have your whole life on 20 terabytes. Okay. And, and there's, the, okay. There's like a psychological component to this too. When people see 20 terabytes, just fill it. Well, yeah. think about it. Because okay. we've got to remember that this is from not necessarily a techie person's perspective as well. When you see a 20 terabyte storage drive in your computer, you might go, oh, gee, you know, I can store everything on this. And people yeah, don't true. practice safe backup. <laughs> that's true. I don't either. So, uh, well, no, I, I take care of it. I know. <laughs> I make sure. Actually, our stuff could be safer right now. It could be safer. Um, and I, I do I'm just glad it's faster. I, it was driving me crazy. It, I would sit there and try to open a file, and it would take like 10 seconds okay. to load. Okay, we've been through this. That was a power saving yeah, measure. It was dumb. I had the You're discs. You're talking about how, like. I had the discs parked when they were not being used, which, by the way, means they're not sitting there spinning okay. idly. Okay. Which I it think. It just made it so that I never used our server at home. 
Yes. I saved everything to I my know. desktop. Okay, so I which told, is very safe. I told the drives not to, yeah, that's not safe at all. Well. Because I don't have your desktop backed up <laughs> at all, because why would I? It's just Windows. It's utterly meaningless <sighs> at this point. It doesn't do anything. Okay. Well, it's faster now, so that's good. Yes, okay, so I changed it so the drives don't go to sleep. You're welcome, my princess. I actually <laughs> considered just moving the uh, Stornado to home that all SSD server that's probably oh. worth like 30 grand. Yeah, no, uh, that's but Jake, Jake got mad at me. He was like, you what, mate? And so I brought it back. 